Okay, uh, welcome to chapter 14, The Culture of Journalism, Values, Ethics, and Democracy. Um, this is something I'm very, very well versed in. I spent 16 years in television news, and some of the things that you hear today will be from the book, and some things you're going to hear are going to be a little different because I've been through it. I know uh, what's going on in newsrooms. Um, I do that for as long as I do. You pick up a lot, and what you're going to hear is the absolute truth. Um, sometimes when you read stuff in these books, they've got an agenda uh, one way or another, and I'm not about the agenda. I'm about telling you what is actually going on um, in, at least from my expert, my uh my experience um, in those 16 years I've worked big I've worked small I've seen both sides I worked in education I worked in government so I've got a very uh, unique uh, experience because I've seen behind the curtain in all the different uh, various venues that are up for debate on what happens and what doesn't happen there that has possibly shifted the way things are presented and viewed today, and journalism is definitely uh, one of them. And it's changed a lot. So let's uh, let's uh, get into this. All right. All right. So the book starts off with uh, this, this this first channel uh, chapter uh, talks about Nellie Bly. Um, Nellie Bly was a uh, originally uh, worked as a a journalist in Pittsburgh um, and she was very young she was like 23 and her name was Elizabeth Cochran and they basically didn't give her the kind of stories that she thought she wanted that she wanted to uh, really dig her teeth into they gave her a lot of uh, fluffy stuff there was a lot of sexism with what they considered unladylike stories um, and she wanted to do some really good uh, investigative work. And through that time, uh, they, uh, she basically uh, was able to uh, go undercover. She went on, she got, uh, she moved to New York City and she got in, in to the New York world, the Joseph Pulitzer. You should remember that name. And she originally did an expose. She pretended that she was crazy. Um, and basically, or mentally ill, I should say, and she, uh, and this was a different time, they would, they would put people in mental hospitals if they didn't speak the language, or, and, and especially uh, with women, and she was a single woman, and at the time, and uh, she was able to convince them, and then she did an expose on the plural conditions there, and that caused that um, secured her a position and a job and a reputation as a journalist and did some other things as well. Um, so this was, uh, this was uh, revolutionary. She uh, uh, it was you know, first woman, well, there were women reporters, but a, uh, invest from an investigative standpoint and the, 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 uh, the measures that she took to get the story uh, was to... Uh, was different, um, and it's been repeated since. This was in the late nineteenth, uh, late nineteenth century, when this was going on. Um, so, um, so we're starting off with that, and the beginning of journalism, and uh, and th this is where we see what is called stunt or detective journalism. And I've known people that have done stuff like this. I was at News Twelve Long Island. They were doing a back in the late. 90s they were doing an investigative report on raves and ecstasy because that was the new thing at the time and we had a couple of younger looking a reporter and photographer that could uh that could swing being undercover in that because they were both they were both uh pretty young and looked young so uh they were able to get into a rave at some warehouse um, and we got the whole uh, thing like that, so I've seen, and, and I've known about that in the past, so I've personally, I've seen uh, that where I've worked. 
Um, but yeah, so you see detective or stunt journalism and Nellie Bly, she's one of the people that uh, if you want to learn a little bit more for her of her, she's in the uh, list of people for the final project. So uh, if you wanted to take uh, that one up, you can learn a little bit more about her that way. But it's more the detective or stunt journalism, which is um, has been used in the past. It's kind of gone away because investigative journalism, for a variety of reasons, has decreased, sadly. Um, either budgetary reasons or technology reasons or lack of staff reasons or corporate shifting and ownership reasons and glut of information reasons. and It's not just one reason. You'll find there's lots of different layers to lots of different issues and lots of that create the reality that we live in. So I hope everyone's always looking for that one or two reasons and it's never it's never that simple um, you have to be able to step back and look and and you'll find a lot of answers to a lot of things why everybody always wants just the one quick answer the two quick answers it's life and things that pop up are just more more than that um, so and that's something you have to understand not only in this field but just in general a lot of, a lot of people don't want to aren't willing to do the work or yeah, they can understand it, but, oh, that's too much for me. Oh, I don't need to hear that much. Just give me the simple answer. It's not just a simple answer. I mean, you're getting older. <laughs> I think we're just getting a lot lazier, too, as a society. Um, and that could be hurting us. So, But we're going to continue on with uh, uh, journalism. And we're going to turn on with uh, journalism in the, uh, in the new in the information age. All right. So what is news? And the, the textbook has a wonderful little definition. It's right here. I'll say it. The process of gathering information and making narrative reports that offer selected frames of reference that help people make sense of important events, political issues, cultural trends, prominent people, and unusual happenings in everyday life. A little bit of a... Uh, of a, of a, of a, of a little bit to uh, define one specific thing um, but it's it's been blurred what is news has been blurred between what is news that people need to know um, news is supposed to be audio uh, audience centric when you're doing it what are the people in your given area interested in because what's considered news in Towson Maryland might not be news in, in uh, Glendive, Montana. All right, they might you have different people, different backgrounds, different things going on. There may be different uh, uh, economics uh, going on, different industries. Um, you know, so there's just uh, there's just a uh, depends on what news is. Now, of course, there's universal news stories. Heck, the, pan the, the pandemic as we are all living through right now, but. I mean, in an everyday, new, uh, regular, uh, normal, run-of-the-mill uh, cycle, news is different from given area to given area, um, because you need to, you want to be able to serve those people in your given area as best you can, uh, and it's important wherever you go that if you do get in this industry and do be going to the journalism track. That you, that, okay, great. Yeah, they let you have a job in journalism. Now you have to really just dive headfirst into everything that is important there. Yeah, there are certain tools and certain ways of telling the story will be the same, but it's going to be upon you to really start diving into what is that area. What are they interested in? What is you know what makes news what are people what are people paying attention to um, so it and that I mean that's a wonderful definition of news but news is different from one place to another and then you have national news and that's even broader and I've been through that too um, so it's it, it's news is whatever that audience is really kind of interested in and of course there's lots of crossover but you'll find two areas never quite being exactly the same um, from one area to another area because there's, there's just differences. 
and there's a criteria for newsworthiness, and they got quite a few things in there. And you think about all the different stories, so timeliness, when's it happened, breaking news, all right? Uh, it's, it, it, you know, they, there could have been a fire at, uh, think about Towson, it might have been a fire at one, in one of the dorms, and it just happened, you know, so timeliness has just happened, breaking news. Proximity, once again, it was close by. Now, it, you might have had a fire at some school at a dorm in, in uh, Idaho, You're, unless there was massive damage and lots of people were hurt or was some other other like group that was responsible for it. And it you're probably not going to hear about it, but you know, but because it was a thousand, it was all it was directly affected you. When it was close by, you're going to hear. Chances are, going to hear about it. Um, conflict. Stories are all lots of stories, and lots of stories are about conflict. Two sides to one to each story. It could be about politics. It could be about e economics. It could be about any number of uh, things. Conflict is always a major uh, source of con uh, of any story. So. A lot of times they're produced and they usually get the most eyes or ears, depending on the venue, prominence, people of prominence, uh, politically, um, lots of times. And sometimes it works, but sometimes maybe we put too much, um, too much uh, emphasis on prominence um, it, with celebrity, um, especially people who shouldn't be famous or shouldn't be have empires but they are but they do they're famous for no reason and then there's the other times when certain people represent certain things just because people are used to seeing them in that way um, and maybe they shouldn't be um, but but people still are interested in that and are interested in those people human interest uh, lots of, we use this constantly this is probably one of the better ways to tell a story um, about uh, bigger political or other issues of the day as opposed to just using blank facts, um, stats, um, seeing how the issues and the topics of the day directly affect the people affected, uh, uh, the people that are involved with it. You know, every person down the street, the single mom with two kids and trying to get by on the budget and health care and all that as opposed to just talking it's just seeing generic politicians talking about this that and the other thing you're actually seeing who's affected by it um, and it, it gives a connection to the people it's probably the best way to tell a story in those instances um, consequence when it, you know how we're seeing the, uh, the the effects of certain things now, this is what's happening um, usefulness, novelty, deviance. Uh, if you think about novelty and deviance, uh, it's, these are the crazy stories when, say, a, uh, you have a, um, a um, you haven't seen a certain celebrity in a long time or a former actor, and out of nowhere they get arrested for something. Maybe they were possessing drugs or arrested for firearms. Thing, bringing on a train on a plane or something or something along those lines um, and then the novelty they have goofy things going on like cheese rolling in Britain I cut that so many times um, the in Spain they have this tomato uh, this, tom <laughs> this tomato throwing uh, thing where they're, they're just throwing tomatoes. They do it every year. I've been doing it for hundreds and uh, hundreds of years in Spain. I can't tell you how many times I've cut that video. Um, so it's you know, there's, and they all you know, they all have their place. They all have their place. Some obviously are more serious and more important than others, but it's a combination of a lot of different things, and it's a it's a lot of different types of stories and lots of different approaches for stories for what. So you have as much content as possible. And this goes into how people think, what they're looking at, what attracts people, what attract eyes, ears, whatever the case may be. Um, so it's, is, is, it, is it interesting to people? And we as people are different in different level. We, are, we have different levels to us.
Now, there is some facts with uh, values in American journalism and the thought that uh, um, the general belief that journalists should be neutral observers. I don't think that's been as popular. It's still out there, but I've seen between corporate and personal um, issues and political issues and ownership issues. We keep talking about the companies that own just about everything, how it's changed from when I first got in, in 1995, just before the whole 96 Telecommunications Act and ownership changes to where we are today. And it's a very, very different world. Um, so we're seeing um, what the, the whole thoughts of, uh, of, uh, of, of neutrality. And this is something that, yes, at first it wasn't the case when you were dealing with newspapers and this, well, objectivity, as we talked about in the newspapers with uh, the New York Times to try and be objective with new sales of uh, sales uh, strategy. But it's really turned into, however, doesn't regardless of the origins of it, if you think about it, if if we are the fourth estate, and we've already talked about being the fourth estate, overseeing the people in power, making sure the different branches are doing what they're supposed to be doing, you kind of have to be neutral with what you're doing. Now, it's not to say there's not to be some some sort of Uh, some sort of uh, um, some sort of now it's not said now uh, not to say there shouldn't be any sort of of translation or explanation of certain things but it's it, there's and a lot of times people will go above and beyond that and in one way or another even some people don't even realize they're doing it they do take a side in certain places where they probably shouldn't and then they they uh, they uh, they compromise their reputation as journalist and the the venue that they work for so that's something you have to think about um, and so it's, it's when you're talking about neutrality it does boost credibility lots of times they do find it, it at times it would boost sales um, but they basically sound the same they want people to just get the news we don't need to be told what to think and I find a lot of that is happening today in the way a lot of the uh, things are presented and I've seen it firsthand. Um, so, and, but, you know, so, and one person that uh, was part of that was Herbert Gons. Um, and he believed uh, basically what their subjective values that shape news um, judgments, ethnocentrism. And what is that? It's the kind of thought of um, when we think about when we in the media are covering things outside of this country that most usually um, and do, so a lot of times what they'll do is they'll judge other countries based on how they are compared to us and, and the United States and how we do things so sometimes you, you'll, our values should we really be doing that um, and what he did was basically he went to a few different media outlets, well-known media outlets, and just paid attention, was watching to see how they reported things and what they did and what they said and how they went about their days and how they did their job. And this is one of the things he found. Uh, responsible capitalism, uh, basically saying that uh, sometimes um, they assume that Business people compete with one another and not pro primarily to maximize profits, but to create increased prosperity for all. Um, and, and he noticed that uh, though a lot of the uh, 
importers and editors would condemn monopolies. Um, a lot of times, uh, there wasn't any real criticism of a lot of oligopolistic oligop nature, oligopolies. We talked about a handful of companies owning uh, owning a certain business. And then you had your small town um, pastoralism, basically saying how when they would cover stories from the, from the uh, small town perspective, it would be rather... Uh, if, if something bad happened and say something bad happened in a small town, drug increase or something, there was always a, a hint or thought that, oh, look what's happened in the small town because of the big city. A uh, big city comes back, uh, pokes its head and nose into small town America. And that was a tool that was used quite a bit. And then individualism. I'm um, saying that uh, a lot of times uh, the journalist, um, especially in the print, not as much in in the uh, broadcast news section, um, because you need a group and team of people to do it, but from, more from a, a traditional print, individual uh, journalist wanting to do things on their own, kind of staying away, get the story that they need to get, not to be distracted by certain things, and when they need somebody, they get a hold of them. Um, but uh, how that uh, um, how that was uh, different, and basically that um, a lot of times it would focus on uh, the uh, the journalism for that would focus on personal triumphs and neglect, and then neglect to explain how large organizations and institutions would work or fail. So they're so busy being the individual and. Trying the trying to confront and expose corruption, um, but when it came to uh, 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 other things, it just didn't work. All right, so all right, so so we're we're seeing that, and then uh, some other values. Basically, uh, it's a reporters have traditionally aligned facts with an objective position and values with subjective feelings. Um, and they talk about the difference of uh, how cable channels, and I've worked f for one of them, um, under my reporters who try to report fairly. Now, this is for me coming from, from the industry. I'm going to say with an, in your book, especially in that one uh, thing that they talk about, a um, case study, talking about bias in the news, and this is where I... Um, I don't necessarily agree with them. I think they have uh, an axe to grind. It's their book. I guess they can do that. I think they should have more responsibility because they're teaching you guys um, uh, and teaching students who aren't doing this. It does exist. Bias does exist. Um, and if it didn't, um, then places like Fox News wouldn't have succeeded um, from the standpoint that prior to the to the creation of it in 1996 they were ba everyone was basically getting the same story and a lot of it was rather one-sided in in the portrayal and what everybody was doing it was basically, it was basically doing the same thing but if you could get pay and only people who truly understood both sides of a story who were really watching and looking and like it was basically sometimes they knew they were doing sometimes they didn't know they were doing giving one side of a story um, and they came along and they said there are two sides of the story there are um, and yet yeah, I'm not gonna be delusional and say they didn't do um, conservative things they did and I, I would call them out on when they didn't when they didn't uh, live up to what they were supposed to live up to um, and so but yeah so and this it was different and, and the simple truth was if reality was and I'll tell you this from a financial standpoint if the reality was of the time that 
that the media up to that point was all conservative and from a monetary standpoint, um, then Fox News would have been a very different thing. Rupert Murdoch would have said, all right, we're going to do this, this more left-leaning liberal side simply because of what was going on at the time. You, know, so you basically have half the people noticing and they're just hearing one side of the story. Um, and I personally think it needs to be down the middle and straight and forward because you can't do your job. We can't do the job that we're supposed to be doing unless we are as neutral as possible. Um, and But that's really not happening. Um, lots of people don't realize they do it. Um, and I'm not saying, and especially, and see, it's, it's different. Um, it, it trickles down, all right? It's, it starts basically at the higher levels, your networks and your higher profile newspapers and EP. Um, and then it kind of trickles down, but it's when it goes to like the smaller, like the affiliates, the smaller newspapers, a lot of these media outlets are struggling for staff. So you're struggling for staff and you... You, there's only a certain amount of local news that you can do. So you don't have that much money. So then we have things called wires. We have feeds from other stations. From all, all the big networks have their own news feeds that we supply national and international news. That's where the problem is. What, who are they affiliated with? Who are they subscribing to? What are they putting out? Um, who are they attributing? Um, oh, this is what was said in the New York Times, um, but what about the are the, the questions never asked? Are they compromised, especially in the time we live now, in the corporate structure that we live in now, also from the political uh, structure that that we are now, educationally, um, what are what are people being brought up to uh, being taught? And while, while you're in school, because what I was taught in school um, is very different than what you've been taught in school. Um, some people believe you guys are getting 5th to 7th grade educations in comparison to when I went to school. Uh, what did they fill in the, in the gaps with? Um, it's a lot of different things. And then that changes how things are produced the information that they're given. There's so many, there's not just one thing. There's a lot of different aspects to it that can change the way things are reported and presented. And if you don't think it's a big deal and people basically making excuses, sometimes they're like, oh, we, 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 we're, we're unbiased about it. Up to a point, but you can tell when you are there, when you're around, you can pick up, though they may not specifically say, I am this or I am that politically, you can tell because how many times I I'd, I'd would sit and I'd be doing some work and then I hear somebody who might be doing a, writing a story and they've got to look at um, interviews or a big long press conference and they're picking out what they want for their for their story, and you hear comments of one of one nature or another, and you they they without even knowing they're doing it because either they're getting upset or they're they're cheering on that person. You're you're finding out what their beliefs are by how they're reacting to it. And then in sometimes if you really look at the way some of these people who are producing. Where, how, where they put and place certain stories, uh, what they include, what they don't include, how they write that said story, how much time they might give to one and none the other, how do they... It, there's so many different angles and aspects to it. it. It comes through in the product that they're given. And part of the problem is also every newsroom I've ever worked in has always had, of course, lots of TVs around, and they're always looking to see what the other stations are doing. And then they also have newspapers, and they check that stuff out too. Um, and part of it is to see how 
how they did it from a competition standpoint because they know they're going to be doing the same stories. Um, but then a lot of times is you're finding journalists not going, taking that extra step, asking those questions that need to be asked, just going on their their day and not really being journalists, but just kind of relaying information. Um, and you, I've seen it many times where if it's someone they agree with, if they're at a press conference, they agree with them politically, they might not be, they won't be as adversarial with them as opposed to someone um, they are opposed and you'll start seeing uh, the hard-nosed questions need to, that need to be asked aren't asked or that well, w will be asked um, and it happens quite a bit lots of times they they don't even know they're doing it and sometimes they do um, and you can tell who the you know who the grandstanders are um, and who are, who are more professional in the way they go about doing their questions. And so it's very much, and it's all, like I said, it also has to do with corporate structure too, and we, with who owns what, um, with Disney owning ABC. And you look at ABC and who's in charge, and who's like, think about Good Morning America. Who is one of the main anchors on Good Morning America? George Stephanopoulos. Do you know who George Stephanopoulos is? George Stephanopoulos was the main press person and uh, speaker for Bill Clinton leading up to his 1992 uh, election and had other positions in there. Um, not really a journalist. Not to say he doesn't deserve a position at ABC. Um, you could think he'd be a great addition for a political show where he, he's on one side and someone of a uh, conservative nature is on the other, or as a, or as an analyst, or within the White about the White House, and of course, he, he, I'm not saying he doesn't deserve a job. I just don't think that role is appropriate for him because he's supposed to be a journalist, and you know he's not objective. You know, <laughs> nothing about him is objective, but he's there. Did you even know that he used to have that job? Most pro people probably don't. It's like, oh, he can take it. No, they don't care. They're they're political animals. And that's what, you know, and they'll call themselves that. Um, that's everything about them is political. Um, and you'll find a lot of people within a lot of these different venues, especially in the broadcast side, who are at the higher levels are either related to, married to, have some sort of tight connection or relationship um, within these ma major journalistic outlets that are in some way connected to someone of a, in, in, in a high political office or connection in there, and it, that there's conflict of interest there. So it's, and then uh, of course, the corporate standpoint, we talk about, you know, it's like Jeff Bezos and opening the Washington Post and specifically owned it, went to buy it because he wanted to have his influence and his ideas on there. Does, how does that hurt? How does that affect the the, the judgment on, of a given day, news day, and what they cover and how they cover? These are things that need to be asked and 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 not just pushed to the side. Oh, I, I, this is what I care about, and I I don't want to think about that. You can't think like that because then that's not journalism. That's propagandism. Um, and we have sadly seem to be going more and more towards it. Why? Because they talk about the whole niche things, um, a niche audiences and yeah we it, it, we have become more niche with especially when cable came out but information isn't niche it's not <laughs> what do they want to hear what makes me feel fuzzy and secure in my beliefs as opposed to what needs to be told to <laughs> make sure people are making good decisions because if you're portraying people in a positive light all the time or so much so that when something goes wrong and they're doing something wrong, they're not getting called out on it or they're almost in a way basically relaying what is considered spin, then that's not really journalism. Right? You have to go in with the same 
enthusiasm, the same heart, the same passion of getting at the truth. And despite who may be in that position, it doesn't matter. Um, people were, uh, who would say when they were covering um, the previous administration that they were scared to ask certain questions and challenge them. And this is what the White House press corps were supposed to be above all that. And when you get to that level, you're supposed to be at the highest level of pretty much at this industry. Um, they were scared to challenge um, because they wanted access. This is things they said. They, they were saying, we didn't want to um, rock the boat too much. I was like, you would never think about them rocking the boat now. And it needs rocking. <laughs> either but either way, it needs rocking there. It needs rocking now. Um, that's your job. And it's like, it can't, and you have to try to do it with the same passion. Oh, and not saying, oh, I hate to ask you this because you like them. No, you ask it in the same professional manner. Either way. You know, it's you know, because you have a job to do, and the truth is the most important thing. Truth always travels straight ahead. The left and the right try to rip it one way or the other. Um, but the truth always travels straight ahead. And they try to, they try, the left and right try to bend it to their will or bend it to the way they want you to think or want to believe. Um, and then by that time, it's not the truth. It's anything but. But it's our job as reporters and journalists to make sure that, that people are getting good information. So, and there's also aspects, uh, ethical predicaments, um, deploying deception. What's that mean? Um, basically, this goes into um, absolutist ethics that, and in this case, I'll talk about Nellie Bly. Um, we will never, ever go undercover. Um, we will always be upfront with um, uh, who we are and reporters and whatever... You know, whatever the case is, it does, the story is not worth that um, or situational. Looking at the a case by case basis, okay, what what is the issue? What is the issue? What is the openness of the uh, the the story? If it needs to be some digging, um, are you going to get that information from traditional uh, means and research? And people be open with you and interviews or are you going to need to do things a little differently and it's they you've got the one with the absolute and the other with situation looking at case by case by basis um, and, i mean i think i think it situational or at least personal for me even though i'm very much about being honest and straightforward and that, as much as possible with, with that i mean if it's this is not something that should be taken lightly, situational. Um, you should still try and always be above board with what you're doing. If all else fails and there's no other way you're going to get a story, then you, it also depends on what you do. All right? And it comes to situational ethics and about getting that story. And, and still following ethics and still being ethical in what you're doing um, but there might we might need to take an extra step or two if all other avenues and possibilities have been exhausted. You know? So it's it, it's tough, and these are the things that part, part about being a journalist, paying attention to these things, and then also as a s standpoint from invading privacy, um, we're trying to to uh, uh, you're on the tightrope of uh, public's right to know and a right to privacy for a certain person. Um, do you talk about some person that like maybe the celebrity got into or maybe a public figure got into a fight at a bar or something like that? And do you put that out? It's a right to know. Is it going to get out anyway? And what what's that going to do? And then also there's, you know, I mean, then there's governmental aspects of it, and and talking about that and safety, and so I mean, this is it's 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 a tough 
it's it's not an easy industry. You have to fight through a lot of different decisions and ethical decisions every day, and that that's part of it. You know, it's and it's that and when people say, hey, oh, it's not that hard. It's incredibly hard between behind, trying to get a story and all the other aspects and all the production you need to know and all these important decisions and legal things and it's and it's and it's not and in the end a lot of times you're not really known you know one knows who you are um few people are known out there but you know how many people uh, journalists are out there working there they're working extraordinarily hard but you have no clue who they are um doesn't take away from what they're doing yeah you've heard of some and they're in some big high um profile jobs but for the mass majority, you, you wouldn't know who they are. Or if you do, it's because you you follow them very closely and you've noticed uh, the name and you like their work. Um, and so it's 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 a tough position. It's a tough job a lot of times. It's lots of things you got to deal with that other people in other businesses and industries don't have to deal with. Um, the Journalism Code of Ethics reporting, uh, they're warning reporters and editors not to take place themselves in positions that produce a conflict of interest. So that means, say you are a, a food critic. Your job is to go into a restaurant and say if the place is good or bad. Um, it's making sure that, and just know that by doing a job, people are going to get to know who you are. Um, and they're probably going to want, hey, don't worry about it. We'll give you free dessert. Oh, the meal is on us. Here's, you know, and you're going to expect at least, and that's why a lot of times these uh, food critics will go to a place and they won't mention that they're going or people might not know what they look like. Um, so uh, they've got that advantage. But once they do kind of like find out, they might try to get a better review than maybe they should and it's upon you to stay above that just also uh, also know that um that you're you know you're gonna in your journeys as a journalist you're gonna be meeting a lot of, and interacting with a lot of the same people um people like for pr people for like uh for politicians or companies and these are the people that are putting stuff out and they're getting stories and you're going to be working with them quite a bit and it's good to have a, a professional relationship because you need the story and it's just human decorum and being polite and nice but then at the same time still being a good journalist and knowing they're not your buddies and Oh, do me a do me a solid. Don't necessarily talk about this. If it needs to be talked about, it needs to be talked about. Um, and it's, so that's that aspect. And also, you could, at times that you could uh, benefit personally. Um, I talked about like free meals, but also, um, and it could also include like access. Well, if you give us good stories, uh, we they might we just might be able to accommodate interviews more often. If you don't. I mean, then that's, you know, it's, that's not a good thing, but it happens. Um, or also, if you think about it, there's a reason uh, they talk about, um, they always kind of tell people, well, if you're a journalist, try not to have, a, like, a side gig in this. It's like uh, owning something, um, a business or something like that on the side because sometimes um, it, you might find yourself – in a position where you're covering a story and say you have a, a bar or something just just an example and you know for a fact that uh, maybe the the city council is going to pass something that could either be that could be uh, uh, beneficial to you because of that and help your bottom line that's one of the reasons they say not to get involved with that, with having uh, businesses like that, because you never know when something like that can pop up and then affect your coverage. So if that's if you want to do that kind of thing, you want to own something like that, uh, once you're done with your 
journalism career, career if you did it, you know, then okay, own what you want. But when you're in there, don't put yourself in a situation that would cause that kind of thing. Um, you don't want to benefit personally, all right? Um, especially the stories that you produce um, from from that. It's you know, it's it's not ethical. Um, you're not really a journalist, all right? So it's it, there's a lot of rules. It's the way it is. Um, okay, and there's some things we need to focus on. Um, also, we talk about, I go back to the 1840s, telegraph was uh, invented. We all talked about, you know, we know how that increased uh, communication. So, well, one part of that was news. It was able to travel much quicker. And then stories got out much quicker because of that. You didn't have to wait. Uh, forever to have a get a story was basically almost uh, at least instant for them back then and uh, it was very very quick um, so it's that that changed thing things with um, how news was covered and now you have more and more technology and and lots of times um, you're, you're finding things that are created now and what happened there um, we got, you got a lot less analysis, especially with political things and context of history um, in, a, in an effort to get it fast, get it quick. Um, we see that today um, where you don't want to kind of like think about what happened in the past. And it goes back to that old, why is it important to know history? You know, it's those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And, I think we're seeing that very much uh, today, and in, in a in a in an effort to get the quickest news and most news um, uh, with the technology and a lot of venues that we have to put it out. Um, we're seeing less and less knowledge of history, even though we have all these wonderful uh, uh, technologies that have give us uh, information. We just don't know it. And we kind of just forget about it, or we just ignore it. And you're not you're not understanding like current news, and this is really important. Things that happen now, in a lot of cases, are developments of things that have been going on up until that point. Uh, so you'll find any number of stories can be from many things that happened before and that gets that gets lost a lot that gets lost in the boom the the breaking news um people forget about that you know it's like what led up to this event oh we don't know oh it just happened okay here we got breaking news here are the details boom 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 but then after that you don't go any deeper or how why did this happen and they, they scathe or they look into it and they don't go that deep. And since people didn't know the history before of what happened, it gets lost and we don't really learn lessons. No lessons are really learned. It's just news is put out, content's out there. People are reading it, watching it, or listening to it. Um, and that's all they really care about because then they can get their advertising. And, hey, look at this. And, and then what are you – or you're, you're, you're putting uh, – creating stories in a certain way so a certain niche will read, listen, or watch what you're doing. Um, and then, once again, you can charge more for advertising. Um, and that's another aspect, too. Where does being a journalist is harder than ever with, with that aspect, too. Is, uh, what's, you know, what are they lo looking at as opposed to what stories are they uh, for the audience of your given area? Are they really important or is it just garbage? Um, and you're losing lots of uh, context and the steps leading into it. People don't want to think about that. It's easier to not to. It's our job to make sure they do that again. And we have to do it again. And people think we need to make people smarter, not just, okay, whatever, I got what I need. Um, it's not helping uh, you and it's not helping us as a society. Um, there's... Also, a debate on a couple different aspects. Um, getting a good story. All right. um, I consider myself a, a storyteller, a, a supposed to be a purveyor of the truth. Um, lots of times, when people are doing their stories, 
they forget they're journalists and a lot of times become screenplay writers or novelists and and for the for the drama of a story they forget the the main tenets and the truth and the basic facts of that story now you can still tell a good narrative story with characters and it's best show an issue or topic or something like that but you have to do it in a responsible way um, it can't go show a, a bias or or a uh, preference either way you try to try to best represent it as best you can now if the other side to that is you know truly that bad I mean really because lots of times it's the way things are portrayed now it's it's not realistic in a lot of ways um, it just fits their brand it's not about fitting a brand it's about telling a story and there's lots of great stories out there um, but trying to do it in the most responsible way as possible oh this sounds good but it has to be true it has to be right because this isn't a movie this isn't a TV show you can do that with the you know, because it's, it's fiction it's supposed to be real and when people go to your venue to take in what you are producing they're expecting it to be true stories real truth and not some over dramatized thing so you think a certain way um, that's not the what we what we're supposed to be doing and then there's the whole stamp uh, standpoint of uh, getting a story first it's this is just I've seen this so many times before. This is why the 2000 election act did that. I uh, ended up the way it did because we called, my station called, my network called it for Bush because somebody in the, the Bush family worked for us and they were in contact with, uh, with the headquarters because he was part of the family. And they went by that as, oh yeah, Florida's going to be called for us. Um, and, you know, that wound up, stirring on lawsuits gore versus bush and and chads and 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 and, and, and punch cards and what's dimple chad and uh, you know it's just and i've cut so much video to that that was just i swore i never name might no offense to anybody um name chad or anybody who may know chad but i said because of that i would never name my uh son named chad because of that um but you know, you, deal, you know you deal with that all the time but you know it's they they what they did was they you know it's, oh we got it we're gonna break it first and oh, for a while there they've gotten better it still happens um, if you look at Kobe Bryant and TMZ um, they they uh, they mentioned that he had died and his daughter died before the family knew um, and they did it to get first. I mean, that's TMZ. Um, and that brings another um, question of what people are watching and listening and referring to as trustworthy. Are they truly trustworthy? Lots of times they're not. Um, yeah, they might be good at certain things, but being good at journalism might not be one of them. Um, and following certain ethical standards might not be one of them and maybe not putting out fully truthful things in an unbiased manner might not be one of them they might have an agenda but they're in a corporate structure that wants them to do some some things and they want to attract a certain demographic and they know that makes the demographic they're attracted to what they do and how they do it and how is that affecting them and how they think and what they're putting out that's all part of it I mean, it's not just stories i know there's a lot of heavy stuff but if this is your mind and how you view things you think that you know am i being told the truth um is what i'm taking in truthful honest and and not just playing to certain beliefs you know, it's because if you don't know the truth, don't know what's actually going on, and it's being twisted in a way that's not truthful, can you make a good decision? Are you viewing it in a fully open way? Are you getting the total story? 
another aspect of getting stories is what we call relying on experts. Um, though I've journalist a lot of the time, experience and, inter and interview and do so many different stories and so much research on things in ways they become experts because they've had to go in deep, deep so much and talk to so many different people and done research on their own. But to be a good journalist, um, one of the things that we do is we we get authorities on certain things to add to that story. I mean, you can talk about stuff, if you, especially scientific stuff or math stuff. That's my personal thing. Um, you'll want to talk to someone who... Um, as a, that that's basically their life, and plus it also takes the onus onus off you of of being that quote unquote expert. You're supposed to be the journalist and telling the story, and it's probably better off that you have somebody who is an actual expert in that, even though you may be well versed with it. It's just probably uh, do that, um, um, and a lot of times we we do. Um, become a little dependent on it. Sometimes it's harder to tell a story if you can't find a person. Um, also, uh, lots of times what we'll do, um, reporters will do, is um, using these experts, they'll, and, and to do a narrative story, they'll create conflict where conflict may not be there, or they might be conflict there, or and it's not as pronounced, or in actual reality isn't, as big a conflict as it's portrayed because you know, they're trying to tell the best story possible and so and then they're not giving the right weight to that conflict because we're gonna have a great story you know that's something you gotta pay, not, pay attention to, to. Um, and uh, the fact that a lot of times uh, the, these experts are uh, Caucasian and male a lot of the times uh, that they say there's an over uh, representation of that so we have, we have that aspect, and then uh, and then trying to be neutral um, and being an expert. One of the things that would happen, and you're seeing a lot, especially in television news, uh, people who are brought in as quote unquote experts on these on these networks, um, on all sorts of networks and so, so it's television shows, and they're actually just journalists, and they're not really experts. They're just telling you what you've you know. The, what they've learned, and they may have learned quite a bit, but they're not really the experts in what they're talking about. And then they stop being journalists, and they start being celebrities. And oh, they're experts on this. No, not really. They're really just a journalist, and that becomes a problem too. Um, and it's it's and part of it is um, oh expediency, uh, easy ease of getting somebody in um, to to interview for for that. And it causes a whole other, and that, that causes a problem for the network or channel using you as an expert, and then your credibility as a journalist. And you start getting a big head, not to mention, you know, I forgot to remember, I'm, I'm not really the expert for this. I'm just telling that story, and I'm not being used as a reporter, but I'm used as an expert, and you're not really. You know, it's not really the case. These are all problems and issues within journalism, and so it, and that's part of it. Yeah, we need to talk to resources, but gotta be careful with it. Balancing story conflict, um, balance. You hear balance uh, presenting all sides of an issue, trying to show that you don't favor a position. Um, sometimes they do it. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you don't have people on one side that are returning your calls or doing any comments so it makes it even harder um, there are problems like time I, you go out and especially locally I go out you're supposed to get your story within that day and have it shot edited and 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 ready for air by the end of the day um, plus you've probably done some other you've definitely done some other things uh, smaller stories in the course of a day um, and you got to do those and the other aspects of online and uh, on the website and, and other aspects and social media and it's it's just more and more and more and more um, and there's only a certain amount of time that you can do it in so time and space constraints a turnaround for it how much time you're given especially you're talking in the 
um, and space for so you're talking about space for like a newspaper or a magazine or online how many words did they want from you, you got to tell the story in some certain amount of time and same with uh, um, news most average the average news what we call package isn't more than an hour a minute and a half long if that I've cut one minute packages cut less than one minute packages um, and it used to be and sometimes you'll go they'll reach the two not as much as it used to um, more features definitely then do maybe are longer but especially at the local level minute and a half 115 to a minute and a half that's how long the packages usually are um, so it's those are full feature stories um, and it's it's cutting more and more time because we need more and more and more stuff so that's part of the problem so these are all these aspects that I'm trying to tell the story as best as possible. How do you, how do you balance that in such a short period of time? Um, also, misrepresentation of the complexity of social issues. Um, are they being put out there in a way that is truthful, or is it being pushed in one way or in another because of any plethora of reasons, personal of that uh of that journalist or the view of the venue the, the, that they work for um, because they have might have an agenda as well um, or just well that's just what we're supposed to kind of think and that's what everyone else is doing that's part of it people don't like to and that's another aspect it's to dig you know and you're digging and they don't want to dig because it's not what what everyone else is saying and they're not and oh we don't have that many people and we there's so many aspects to it because there's less and less people at newsrooms all the time. So it makes it even harder to tell those stories and investigate because they're not putting the time and the, and the money. And they're just trying to get stuff in, get stuff out. And that's another problem with, 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 this, with things. There's so many levels. I keep telling you more and more. Um, so, uh, and, you know, claiming the neutrality makes them appear value-free. Are they value-free? Um, should it be? I mean, it, it depends on the story. It depends on what's going on in that story, what you find. Not what you think you're going to find and wrap it around in the way you want to wrap it that way or present it that way. What have you found and what do the facts show you? Uh, what uh, and Did you do appropriate digging? Oh, I found enough to what, how I want to make the story or uh, I don't have time. Uh, I Just here, this will be fine. That's part of it too. You know? just it is it's, I've seen it time and again um, so it, that's all part of uh, balance and telling the story so it's really important and then uh, we as the as the press acting as uh, adversaries because we are the fourth estate we're the ones who are supposed to keep it, uh, an eye on those people in power either political or business because they have power in corporate structures as well um, was they directly affect the people and making sure they're being people aren't being ripped off or they're being hurt in some way because of corporate interests, physically, mentally, whatever. Um, so uh, you know that's uh, us being the journalists we're supposed to be and following that uh, important role of being protector, uh, of telling the truth, um, and you know so what is I mean you don't want to be a complete jerk all the time but it's know that that there's an understanding between you and political figures that you know it would be friendly and cordial and respectful but I have a job to do and if there's an issue or there's a problem don't expect me to not ask you these questions because it's my job to do that and it's two-way street that you have a job to do and I have a job to do and and it can get out of control sometimes. Um, try not to. And some journalists who call themselves journalists intentionally will poke and do things just to make themselves part of the story. Oh, look at me. I'm a great journalist. I keep poking, 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 poking. Sometimes the poking is, is deserved, no doubt. And then sometimes they just do it to say, hey, look, I'm me. I'm, I'm, I'm being I'm being a jerk to this person because we all hate that person um, uh, so then you become the story and then you're not a journalist um, you've, you've, you've crossed that line um, and it's you know there's lots of lines lots of lines you have to keep an eye on being a journalist uh, being uh, tough with your questioning 
Um, and that's part of I've done lots of interviews and parts, you know, it's sometimes you have to ask tough questions and sometimes they're not going to like it. Um, but the question is, is do you do it in a fair way because the question needs to be asked? It's, um, or do you, or are you doing it to try to set someone up? Are you trying to make someone look bad? Um, when when you're doing that and how you're framing it and, and feeling a room and that's part of it say a press conference I'm like feeling a room and seeing how something is going and there you'll find sometimes that the journalists will sometimes work behind the scenes beforehand it's like yeah I'm gonna, if I get there I'll talk about this and um, sometimes they do sometimes they don't um, and then there's sometimes you can just when you're feeling a room and seeing how things are going, oh, I'm gonna get him with get this person with this. Um, it, it's almost like entrapment in, in a way. Sometimes they, people it depends on the story. Once again, it depends on the nature of the story. Um, but if you're doing that to to make yourself look, oh, I'm an awesome journalist and I got him. I got this person again, and you're not really adding anything to that story, or you're just trying to. To have a good sound bite or make someone look dumb or or corrupt when they might not be corrupt, they may be corrupt and then they might have deserved it. Um, but uh, trying to get a rise out of someone or something like that, or uh, asking an inappropriate question and, and use the use what you might have gotten in a way that misrepresents something. Lots of misrepresentation goes on. Um, not full sound bites being put out and the way it's written up beforehand completely takes it out of context completely changes the story and completely misrepresents um that person in a negative light um and you know isn't there libel laws yeah there's libel laws um but they can still toe the line just enough so it wouldn't be considered libel and if you remember libel is hard to prove and oh, I was just doing my job, and lots of times they they do get away with it. Um, don't be like that. Be fair. If you have to be tough, be tough when they deserve to be tough, because there are people who deserve uh, that because they've done something wrong. Sometimes it's so oh, we just don't like them. You, know, you can't do that. It doesn't matter what you like. All right, it, it has no clue what matter. It doesn't matter at all who or what you like. You have you have a job to do, um, and you have to do. It in a professional manner. That's what we are. We're professionals. All right. Um, that's all I uh, got for you now. I know it's probably a little bit long, a little long-winded, and I stuttered a little bit. Sorry. Um, but Chapter 14, Part 2 comes next week. All right. Stay safe. Keep working. And I'll talk to you soon.